All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to week four of the semester and the third meeting of Sewer Weather Club. How's everyone doing? Anyone got any uh, plans for this three-day weekend? Oh my gosh, you just reminded me it was a three-day weekend. Right on. Yeah, no school Friday, so don't accidentally go to class. That would that would not be good. Bundle up. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Bundle up. Yes, for sure, for sure. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to show you uh, the t-shirt design. Uh, the first meeting we talked about uh, resurrecting a t-shirt for Severe Weather Club, and so I, kinda, I wanted to show you guys what that was. Uh, let me go ahead and present my screen here. Um, let's present my screen. Um, all right, so... Uh, this is the uh, the t-shirt design that uh, Anthony talked about uh, week one. Uh, this is kind of a bad picture. I had to take it through a piece of glass, but um, if you want to look at it for yourself, it's on the third floor of Tillman Hall um, in that little display case. Uh, this is what the shirt looks like. Um, as you can see, there's this really clever use of the METAR symbols here. Uh, this is the lightning symbol. It's used as an S, and of course the thunderstorm symbol, which is used as an R. Um, I think this is a pretty cool dessert or, or shirt design, excuse me. Um, definitely sort of retro. It definitely looks like uh, an old uh, club t-shirt, but uh, I don't know. I think I like it. Uh, you guys have to let me know what you guys think. Um, but what I was thinking what I would do is I would attach this picture to the next club email. And I would let uh, people respond to us uh, if they like this shirt design. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Let's see. I have a chat here. Or not? I'm not sure what that sound was. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and move on then. That was me uh, raising my hand. Oh, okay, yeah. No, what do you got? Um, I I did remember that last semester I got an email. Um, you can probably send that design or anything else to the I believe the um student the activities office or whatever they are. They have a graphic designer on hand, oh. and so you can ask them to make a design. They will do that for free. Oh, shoot. Okay. Um, I don't um, remember that person's email. Um, but yeah, she sent an email last semester saying, hey, I'm here. If you need anything designed, I'm a graphic designer. Just let me know. Okay. So that's another option. Uh, you can probably send that shirt to her, and then she could probably spice it up a little bit, make it more modern if you wanted, or she can make a new design altogether. Okay. I didn't actually, I didn't actually know that at all. Is that through the Office of Student Engagement? I think so, I yes. I believe it's it's one of them. I don't remember which one it is. Um, I think it's OSA, but I'm not 100% sure. Probably, probably OSA. All right, yeah, no, I actually didn't know about that at all. So yeah, um, if you can find that email, that'd be awesome. Otherwise, I'll just get in contact with them and ask. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm sure I'm sure a lot of us would like a new uh, club t-shirt. But yeah, that's the design that we were talking about. Uh, again, that's on uh, third floor of Tillman, if you guys want to look at that. Uh, a couple other announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, if you're doing weather challenge, we've uh, changed cities. Uh, it's the third day of forecasting, but right now uh, we're forecasting for Los Angeles. Um, it's pretty. It's been all right. Oh, this isn't Western's scores. Let's look at Western scores. Um, something to keep in mind is that LA is right on the west coast there, and LAX is uh, literally right there on the coast. So. Um, you want to make sure that you're keeping track of wind direction there so that uh, you can properly forecast highs and lows there. Um, I'm not sure how we're doing as a, as a school. Got a couple of people who have national consensus. The city's been kind of hokey. Um, the models have been like really disagreeing with each other and like really weird. If we look at uh, the Iowa State Mediogram here for uh, LAX, uh, here's all the, the NAM models. It has a temperature range of about uh, two degrees. It thinks it's going to get as cold as 51 as high as 53 tomorrow. Uh, the GFS has another similarly really small range, although it'll, it thinks it's going to range from 56 to about 58 degrees. Um, and then you look at the moss right here. Uh, the GFS moss uh, thinks it'll get about to 59. And then the NAM moss thinks it's going to get up to 63. So I'm really not sure what the deal with this discrepancy is. Um, what I'd say is whenever you look at these kinds of extreme temperatures or extreme predictions, Go for somewhere in the middle. That's been working out for me so far. Um, but yeah, keep it, keep that in mind when you're forecasting for for LA here. Um, next, we can talk a bit about the weather. 
Uh, obviously, we had uh, quite a bit of snow today. Not too much, but it, it was coming down pretty consistently there this afternoon. Um, that was caused by a little shortwave disturbance that's now moving on to our east. Um, now that that's moved on, uh, what you'll see up in west central Canada here is a pretty high, high pressure system here. We have uh, pressures of about 1050 up here. Um, and then that is sort of extending down here. And so what you will see is that there's uh, this northerly wind at the surface that's going to bring that Arctic air continuing into our region. So it's going to remain pretty cold for tomorrow. Uh, I think we'll be lucky if we reach double digits as the high tomorrow. Keep that in mind. Uh, um, something I want to point out as, uh, let's see if we can go to moisture here. Currently over us, there's a river of a moist Pacific air uh in the mid in the mid levels that's coming from the west uh this moisture is what uh created or what fueled the snow that we got today um and there's actually a chance that we're going to get some snow tomorrow it all depends on the placement of this uh river of moist air so if we if we zoom into our region here midwest come on computer all right so yeah, these, these are conditions right around now. You can see this uh, this river of, of moist air at around 500 millibars. That's where uh, the moisture for today's snow came from. Uh, if we advance forward to uh, tomorrow and into Thursday, well, Thursday's tomorrow, uh, as you can see that uh, that moisture has actually moved south of McDonough County. And so at least the GFS predicts that. And so uh, it may be the case that we don't actually get much snow at all. It just depends on where this moisture actually is. Uh, if we compare it to the... Uh, the euro, the euro is going to largely agree with the GFS there. Um, if we look at the positioning of that moisture as we get into Thursday, um, it's mostly south of, of McDonough County and stuff. So it, it may be the case that we don't actually get that much snow tomorrow. Um, if we do, we might get a light dusting. Although just to confuse you guys, if we look at the NAM here, The NAM, for whatever reason, does not see much of that moisture at all. Uh, whereas uh, the, what we're looking at right here is uh, relative humidity. Whereas the the Euro and the GFS predicts, or we're showing, you know, currents of oops, currents of, you know, 100% relative humidity air. The, the NAM doesn't have any of that, and so I'm not sure what the deal is with the NAM going on there. But yeah, I think it's going to be really dry up here, or not really dry, but not as moist as the other models. We'll go back to the GFS here, because um, as we look ahead into Friday, uh, we'll see that there's even more chance for snow. We've had a really active weather pattern these past couple of weeks, and it's going to continue being that way for a while at least. Uh, as we transition into Friday, we'll see that moisture um, kind of uh, go to the east, but then we'll see another batch of moisture coming in from our uh, west. Uh, this, this amount of moisture right here. Um, this moisture combined with uh, a jet streak above our region, uh, I can show you that as well. We go to uh, wind speeds. What we'll see as we head into Friday here is that, uh, and particularly Friday night and into Saturday morning, is that uh, we're right here, uh, right on the fringes of this uh, entrance region of this jet streak. And so there's divergence there, which means rising motion in the upper atmosphere. Um, and so that combined with the mid-level moisture, oh, not sure where that went. Uh, but yeah, that combined with that mid-level moisture is going to produce um, some snow. Um, uh, our region might get some snow. It again depends on the positioning of that moisture. If we go back to um, surface and precipitation here, we'll go to precipitation type. So as we advance forward here into uh, Friday night and Saturday morning, um, the GFS uh, predicts that we'll get some snow. Uh, let's see, that's, yeah, early Saturday morning, late, late Friday night, uh, predicts that there's going to be some snow uh, over McDonough County. If you look at the Euro, though, um, what we will we'll actually see is that this snow, it actually predicts that the snow is going to be further north. Um, yeah, right here, you can see that this band of snow is actually probably further north, and so it doesn't actually get us having that much. Um, the weather service, from what I understand, uh, is kind of in agreement with the Euro here, which is that we're probably not going to see as much snow as some of the northern uh, northern counties in Iowa and uh, Illinois. Uh, we're probably going to, it's pretty unlikely that we're going to get anything more than an inch. 
and it's more more likely that we're going to get half an inch or less uh, into Friday. Uh, then as we look further into uh, next week, uh, we're probably going to get hit with even more cold air. Um, I know Sunday, I think we have a forecasted high right now of one degree. I've seen, I've also seen as low as negative five as the high for Sunday. So all, all just really bitter cold all around. Um, if you're going to be driving this weekend, please stay safe because there, there might be snow. And again, it'll, it'll be very, very cold. Uh, does anyone have any questions about uh, the weather that's going on or anything else that we talked about? All righty. And with that, uh, I guess we'll get into the presentation that I prepared today. Um, this is a presentation that I did on GIS. Um, something you'll hear a lot about, or something you'll hear a lot if meteorology majors talk about their miners, is that we might to minor in GIS. Uh, and there's a good reason for that, which is that GIS is awesome. Um, the, my goal for this presentation isn't to be like an intro to GIS lecture. I don't want to do that. But what I do want to do is demonstrate to people who might not know what GIS is, what exactly it is, and why you might want to consider studying it. GIS, as we'll see, is a very powerful tool in a lot of disciplines. So I would like to sort of show you why that would be the case, particularly for meteorology and other related disciplines. Um, during this presentation, I can't see you guys. So if you have any questions, feel free to just unmute yourself and interrupt me. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, yeah, let's get into it. Uh, first of all, what is GIS? Well, GIS is an acronym that stands for Geographic Information Systems. Okay, so what is a geographic information system? Well, there's a number of definitions you'll find online. Um, the one that I found that I think is the easiest to explain is that a geographic information system is any framework for gathering, managing, and analyzing spatial data. Now, I know, I know that definition is still kind of vague and abstract and kind of you know, not really clear. And so I'm going to break down each of those things to try and give you a better understanding of what GIS is. But again, as we'll see, GIS is a very powerful tool. It's used in a number of disciplines. Uh, pretty much any field that uses maps uses GIS in some way. So to break down this definition, first I want to look at spatial data. What's so spatial about it? Well, spatial data is defined as just any data with a spatial component. Basically, it just means any data that has a location associated with it. Uh, to show you the importance of spatial data, I just want to give you a temperature or uh, an example. An example of spatial data would be temperature data. What would you do if I gave you the following piece of information? Eight degrees. You're probably going to be like, what, what do you mean eight degrees? What's eight degrees? On its own, the piece of data of eight degrees Fahrenheit is pretty meaningless. Um, it's nothing more than a temperature value, eight degrees. But if I show you this alongside of it, suddenly it makes sense. Oh, okay, eight degrees in Macomb, Illinois. That piece of data only gains meaning when it's paired with a location on Earth. Suddenly, when you compare uh, or when you have eight degrees with Macomb, Illinois, it has that meaning. That is what spatial data is. Any data that has a location, Macomb, along with a value, eight degrees. And so your reaction to that might be, well, isn't that like a lot of data that we use on a day-to-day -day basis? The answer is yes, exactly. There are tons and tons of examples of spatial data uh, that we use in our disciplines and throughout our daily lives. Uh, I have a small list here that's not even close to exhaustive, but yeah, there are just tons of examples. Uh, let's talk about tornadoes, for example. Um, we could talk all day about wind speeds and enhanced Fujita ratings, but none of that means anything if we don't know where the tornado touched down and where it tracked. Another example might be people. The U.S. Census uh, conducted every 10 years not only just keeps track of how many people are out there, but where they're located so that you're able to make things such as population densities, that kind of thing. Uh, roads and addresses, you know, I'm sure you, you've had that example of your parents, you know, tell you, oh, yeah, just go down to the county building. Where's the county building? Well, it has an address. That's an example of a spatial data. It doesn't just have to be objects either. Elevation, for example, is an example of spatial data. Uh, it has an elevation value associated with a location on Earth. That is what spatial data is, any location or any data with location. Next part of the definition that I want to uh, go through is gathering and managing that spatial data. And that goes into how GIS works a little bit. Uh, first of all, you have to gather the spatial data. I don't want to get exactly into how uh, 
we gather spatial data in GIS. It's kind of beyond the scope of this presentation. But there are a number of ways you could do it. You can get it through GPS. Maybe you get it through weather stations. Maybe you get that spatial data through satellite imagery. Or maybe you create it yourself through a process called digitizing. Regardless, first you have to actually get the spatial data. Then it has to be managed or organized. Uh, the way that GIS uh, organizes data is that it organizes it into something called layers. Uh, the best way to explain layers is just that each layer contains one type of information. So you might have a road layer that only has roads in it and another layer that only has like elevation data. And so what happens is that those layers are geo-referenced, which just means that they have a location defined. And so they can be overlaid on top of each other and things that are in the same location in the real world will be in the same location in different layers. This is a kind of an example of a picture that's often used to showcase what a layer is. So for example, you might have an imagery layer right here. And then if you put a population density layer on top of it, uh, the population densities are going to be in the same places in the real world as these imageries are in the real world. That's what gathering and managing spatial data is. And then the last aspect of this definition that's probably the most important is the analysis portion of it. Oftentimes, we're not only concerned with where things are, but we want to know the relationships between th things. GIS is used to analyze or discover those relationships. If we go back to our temperature example. Um, we can use other temperature locations all around the country and combine those into a temperature layer. Then if we combine a temperature layer and pressure layers for all the different layers of the atmosphere with wind layers and put them in a forecast model, suddenly we have a forecast. That is a very complicated example of a GIS analysis. Of course, they don't have to be nearly that complicated. One of the earliest examples of GIS actually dates back to the 19th century. It's a very primitive form of GIS analysis. I don't know if you guys know the story of John Snow, but basically back in the 19th century, there was a cholera outbreak in central London and he wanted to find the cause of it. And so what he did was very similar to what GIS people do today. He first went around and gathered data by knocking on people's houses and asking them, hey, do you have cholera? Uh, he then managed that spatial data by drawing uh, on a map all the houses that had cholera cases. And then what he did was pretty ingenious. He went back to his lab and then he overlaid that map of cholera cases on a map of the water network in London. And what he found was that all of these uh, cholera outbreaks were centered around this broad, this broad street pump right here on this map. Um, and so he showed that to the London City Council. They took the pump off of the broad street uh, well and the cholera cases went away. That is a very early and primitive form of a GIS analysis. And it's very similar to what we do nowadays as GIS analysts. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing. I don't know if I explained that very well, but that's what a GIS is. It's a framework for gathering, managing, and then analyzing spatial data. So now I wanna to demonstrate to you how it's used in a number of fields that you might be interested in. Meteorology, um, something to keep in mind is that meteorology pretty much just is GIS. As Dr. Finch likes to say, um, meteorologists were doing GIS before GIS was even a thing. And yeah, that's true. Pretty much all weather data is inherently spatial. Um, there's no meaning of any weather variables if they're not paired with the location on Earth or in the atmosphere. And so we obviously gave the examples of forecast models as a way of doing GIS analysis. But again, there doesn't have to be that complicated of GIS analysis. Um, there are tons of examples of mapping in meteorology that all relate to GIS. Climate mapping, tornado paths, weather mapping, radar is an example of GIS. There are just tons of examples. I don't want to just list things, but yeah. How about emergency management? Well, again, GIS can be used in a ton of different applications. Um, flood response, for example, you can use GIS to model uh, where the worst of the flooding is going to be based on hyd hydrological measurements on the river. That's a form of spatial data. Maybe damage assessment. Uh, on the right here, uh, this is an example of um, toward damage assessment locations for the Taylorville tornado that hit in late 2018. Um, each of these dots represents a house that got hit by the tornado, and the color of those dots represents the severity of the tornado. And so not only are you able to see where the path of the tornado was, but also how severe it was. Um, it's all used in a number of disaster response scenarios. Evacuation routing is a big one. And I gave the example of wildfire fighting as well. The locations of wildfires is very important. I could go on and on about that, but yeah, GIS is very important in emergency management. 
How about in biology or ecology? There's tons of examples of spatial data in biology, locations of individual organisms, habitat boundaries, biome boundaries. And so there's a number of spatial questions that you could answer in biology using GIS. For example, where is habitat loss occurring? Um, what is the territory of an individual GPS to animal? Um, maybe a complicated question you can answer is, where can we build a highway that will cause the least damage to an ecosystem? Those are the kinds of high level questions that GIS is capable of answering. Um, on, the, on the right here, we have a map of vegetation that just shows vegetation change over the course of 20 years in a location, I believe, on the California coast. So that's another example of what GIS can do in biology. How about in law enforcement and justice administration? Uh, the obvious example is crime mapping. Uh, on the right here, we have what's called a crime heat map, uh, where all the locations in red correspond to higher than average crime locations or high, higher than average crime frequencies. And so these are the locations that you might want to put more patrols and more officers. Uh, it's a better way of allocating resources. Uh, another example that you might not think of is 911 routing. Um, back in the day, whenever you called 911, uh, the operator would just look up your name on a list of addresses or and yeah, just look up your address and then tell the, the fireman or the policeman or whatever. And you better hope that they know where it is or else they have to navigate to it using a physical map. Uh, but nowadays, GIS is used to automate that. It just combines road, address, and ESB layers. Um, and so whenever you call 911, your location is automatically pinged onto that GIS system. And then um, the police or the fire or whatever is automatically routed to that location. Um, saves response time and therefore saves lives. I could go on and on and on about GIS in other disciplines too. Public health is a big one nowadays. Where are the COVID-19 hotspots? This is the COVID-19 dashboard that WIU maintains for the state of Illinois. Uh, that's all using GIS. How about in business? Um, an example of spatial data might in business might be the location of uh, businesses, but also the location of customers. And so you might wanna answer the question, where's the best place to open a new business or a new location of company? And we don't even have to do that at all. We can just look at local government. GIS can be used to model traffic flow it can be used to predict where a new bus line would go that would service the most people. Um, nowadays, during the winter, what is the ideal snow plowing route? That's something that we're actually doing at the GIS Center right now. I could keep going about this, but at this point I've listed like 50 things that GIS is used for. I think you understand the point now. GIS is used everywhere across a ton of disciplines. So you might have lingering doubts. I've just been listing things for like the past 10 minutes. What, ex so what are some real world examples of GIS being used? Well, uh, since you go to WIU, you don't have to look far at all because we have a GIS center. Uh, the GIS center is a partnership between WIU, Macomb, and McDonough County, just kind of managing GIS databases for all of them. Uh, we've been doing a lot. Uh, that 911 example that I gave, uh, the GIS center is currently building up uh, next generation 911 GIS databases for the entire state of Illinois so that uh, those GIS systems can be standardized and improve response times. Um, we also maintain utility databases for like the city of Macomb. Uh, we maintain that COVID-19 dashboard that I'm sure you've used at least once or twice. Some of the things we did, I, I gave you that example of the tornado or, or that Taylorville tornado mapping um, in 2019 when those floods were bad. Uh, along the Illinois and Mississippi rivers. Uh, the GIS Center helped a lot with uh, IEMA to help manage those, um, those response efforts by doing GIS work. That's actually me, that's a picture of me at the IEMA Command Center uh, helping uh, the head of the GIS division with uh, some mapping things right there. Um, we do a lot of other things. And so if you're interested with any real world examples of uh, what we do at the GIS Center, uh, I recommend heading over to gis.wiu.edu and checking out some of our web maps. Uh, my personal favorite is the health, uh, health department web map, which shows you uh, all the restaurants in McDonough County and whether or not they're passing or failing their health inspections. And so to round this out, I want to step back. I've been bombarding you with information about GIS. And so I just kind of want to explain to you why you should study it. Well, first of all, GIS is a very fast growing industry. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, it's actually the second fastest growing industry um, on the market, second only to like pharmaceuticals. So just knowing GIS makes you very employable. Um, it's enough to get 
do certain jobs just as a GIS analyst. And many people are just looking for those kinds of people. If you're a meteorology major, the National Weather Service, while that's not required, it definitely likes applicants to have some experience with geospatial analysis. So studying GIS would help with that. If you're a biology major, um, something to keep in mind is that many biology internships don't even consider applicants without GIS experience. It's for this reason that um, the grad programs for ag and biology here at WIU now require GIS courses because so many of the students that were graduating weren't even competitive in these internship applications. Uh, if you're doing law enforcement and justice administration, uh, many agencies specifically are looking for people with GIS experience. Um, so having GIS on your resume is a good way to get a leg up on that. Ultimately, GIS is always a good resume booster. Um, it's useful in a ton of applications, and so people will like to see that you have it. Um, Western has both a GIS major and a GIS minor. So if you're all at all interested in doing that, I would recommend talking to either Dr. Thompson, Dr. Sutton, or your academic advisor and seeing what it would take to do either the major or the minor. That's all I have for you guys. Do you have any questions? Any questions at all about my presentation or about GIS? So about, um, uh, so about GIS courses, um, what kind of are you looking at for that? Is it just like, like, what's an example of a course, like a class you would take for a GIS, like minor or major? Yeah, so the uh, the GIS courses beyond just the, the introductory, like what is GIS courses, um, they're mainly lab courses. And so what you'll do is you'll have lectures that tell you about how data works or depending, it's obviously there are different focuses of the classes. Like, for example, if you're taking a data class, you'll have lectures that focus on different GIS data models, and then, you know, where to get GIS data. And then the lab periods, are you actually doing GIS procedures? You're doing literal GIS analysis, just the same that you would do in the real world. Um, and you're just doing them with the help of the instructor. And so, so it's honestly really great to have some real world practice using GIS. Uh, these are actually a couple of examples that I made uh, for a couple of my GIS courses. Uh, this one on the left I'm particularly proud of. This is a map that shows the percentage of each county in Illinois that's taken up by cornfields. Um, I got that data by downloading it from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And I divided the total number of acres used for growing corn by the total land area of the county. And then I symbolized it based on that percentage. And so that's the kind of analysis that you would do for like a class project, for example. And then... Um, they can get more complicated or less complicated depending on what course you're taking, obviously. But that's the kind of the structure of GIS courses. They're lab focused, so you get some real experience doing GIS. How long did that uh, map on the left take you? So this map was actually done as it was one fourth of a final project. I had to make four maps for that final project. Um, actually, getting the data and performing the analysis didn't actually take that long, only about 30 minutes. Now that course was actually a cartography course, so it was all about making very well-designed maps. And so all the intricacies of the symbology and um, which fonts I used and which color I used and have making sure the inset map was properly scaled and all that, that took a few hours, but that's because it was an advanced GIS course. But yeah, doing a GIS analyses like these don't have to take very long at all. That's really good. Cool. Yeah, that's another thing. GIS is just genuinely really interesting. Uh, you don't have to do it just for um, class. Uh, there's a lot of GIS data that's just publicly available. And so if you have access to uh, GIS software, you can just mess around and see what kind of maps you can make, what kind of relationships you can find. It's kind of interesting. Any other questions? If not, then I guess I can end that presentation. Um, I don't really have anything else for you guys. Um, I might not have, we might not have club next week. It depends on uh, if I have a, an idea for a presentation or um, if there's something else going on. Uh, I'll keep you guys posted on that. Uh, but in the meantime, definitely look out for that email so uh, we can see uh, shirt designs. If you're interested in a shirt, be sure to let uh, us know by responding to that email. Um, also, get in contact with OSA to see if we can get them to get that shirt design or design something else. 
Uh, but yeah, if there's no other questions, then I guess I'll see you guys next week. Uh, Ian, do you mind staying? I have a question. For you. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. Also, I think I'm echoing in your. Uh... Oh, I'm sorry. I guess my volume is oh. just too high. I apologize. Oh, it's okay. Um, yeah, I'll just ask you a question after. Okay. After the fact. Well, I'll see you guys later then. I sent you that email. You have it now. Yeah, I saw that. Thank you.